Arafday is a remote village in the district of Songli, which is about 450 kilometers southeast of Mumbai. In ancient times, the region around Songli was the capital of the Shalakya dynasty, which ruled India. The soft pink glimmer of the morning sun spreads across the trees and huts on the plains as the sun edges up over the distant horizon. The lull of the night is quickly shattered by the symphony of birds and crowing roosters. This morning scene is common in Arav Day, the hometown of Lokanath Swami. Village life in India is inevitably bound with timeless culture, traditions and values. The majesty and splendor of untouched nature is exemplified in the simple life of villagers, where joy and hardship merge in a struggle for survival and preservation. A struggle which is crucial to the solution of ecological problems and social dilemmas in modern day society. Whenever Lokanath Swami travels around the world, he's happy to return to his home village Arav Day. Your home is where your heart is, and his heart is here. Lokanath Swami's travels have taken him to many foreign countries and he observed in India as well that people who live in big cities and industrial areas need to experience a lifestyle free from stress, worries and anxieties. They're not any longer in touch with the beauty of nature and the comfort it affords us. This pure and natural lifestyle has a profound effect on a healthier and happier life. All that is needed is here. Fresh air and clean water, fruit gardens and vegetables and wheat grow in abundance. These scenes look so beautiful and peaceful now as they have been for thousands of years. But for how long will it remain this way? Many things have changed in Arav Day. They're not the same as they used to be. To this effect, Lokanath Swami is in the process of documenting his experiences in a book, which gives a glimpse into village life 50 years ago. Lokanath Swami often remembers his childhood when he was playing freely around and growing up in the lap of nature. At the foothills of the mountain, he would come to herd the buffaloes and cows. The panoramic view of his village, Arav Day, was simply fascinating with its hills and clusters of trees. It's so important for children to be in close contact with nature. Before falling asleep, the grandparents would recite stories from the Puranas or Mahabharata, and then they would often dream about Sita Ram and other great personalities. During the school days, the children used to address their teachers as Guruji. They were just like gurus and taught everything by their personal example. They were shown great respect and in return they treated the children with affection. Nowadays the title of Guruji is just a formal name. At 
At the beginning of the school day in the assembly hall, the children would offer prayers to Saraswati and the Almighty Lord. And with their blessings, they would begin their lessons. The curriculum at that time was God-centered, not man-centered, and moral education was very much part of that curriculum. Lokanath Swami recently visited his school again, and the only photographs he noticed in the classrooms were those of politicians and scientists. No mention is made about the immortal soul and the supreme. This aspect of spirituality has been entirely ignored. Only secular needs are emphasized. The children would often cry before they went to school because of their attachment to their parents. When the school was over, they would run back to their homes and meet their parents with long embraces. Family relationships were very tight and filled with love and affection. The whole village was like a united family. There was no disparity. If some leader would bring forward good thoughts and ideas for the benefit of the village, everyone would follow that advice. There used to be humility and humbleness in people. They respected each other. During the time of the Deepavali festival, in the morning or at dawn, the young boys and girls would offer their respect to the neighboring elderly persons and receive blessings from them. In the present climate, young people avoid the association of elderly persons. The feeling of respect has almost disappeared, and cultural values, which are very important aspects of social life, are getting lost. Over the past decades, village life began to experience changes and transformations. Some of them are perhaps for the better, but some are being looked at with great concern and worries, as they impact directly the survival and shelter of millions of villagers. Eighty percent of the Indian population live in small villages, but the number is rapidly decreasing. Is this a sign of progress or a sign of social decline? Villagers were known to live in peace, harmony and joy, ready to share each other's burdens and eager to help others. This is changing due to the mentality becoming more self-centered. We see that villages are getting bifurcated into divisions of groups and caste. They are forgetting real human values. The very character of the village is gradually being lost. People are overlooking human values. The elders were never unwanted or considered worthless, but wise, with lifelong experiences from which the young would always benefit. There was an awareness that although the old may have been frail, 
they would always offer valuable advice to the younger generation. And that was one of their important contributions. Family doesn't come together. Only time the family is together now they are while watching the TV. Uh, my heart breaks, the heartbreaking experience to see these changes. In the past, a typical scenario would be one big home, one big family. The family unit is deteriorating. The very fabric of the family spirit is being diluted and the villagers are becoming more selfish. There is a kind of tension between the forces of ancient heritage and values on one hand and modern values on the other hand. Because of their natural lifestyle, people were healthy and strong. The doctor in the local area rarely visited. There was no need, as hardly anybody fell sick. In the past, there was not so much need of clinics, but now people need medicines and hospitals. People used to do more work, and they did not have so many diseases. Even the elderly women were quite strong. They would grind grains by hand with a grinding stone, while singing songs that were related to the Lord and his pastimes. These were traditional songs called Lokita. The grinding was heavy physical labor. Because of such exercise, especially during the early morning hours, their appetite would increase. Food would then be digested nicely, and thus they would stay healthy. The men were also very healthy and strong. This is naturally the result of eating self-grown fruits, vegetables and grains, which give strength and vigor to the body. There was a lot of interaction with the cows and bullocks. The cow was considered especially valuable. goba gas, which is produced from cow dung. They used it for cooking, for fuel and to light lamps. This is self-sufficiency. There was no need to depend on an industrial network to get some light or cooking facilities. The villager's hobby used to be raising nice bullock pears. Even nowadays, they still have bullock cart race competitions. 
They decorated the bullocks with embroidery cloth on their backs on special occasions. The horns were also being colored in various ways. The cows were treated just like mother. On one particular day, the whole village would gather and officially worship the cows and bullocks. Even Lord Krishna himself decorated and worshipped them. It is an ancient tradition which is still intact to some extent today. However, people are losing their previous emotions and feelings towards the animals that are very useful in daily life and religious functions. The farmers would plough their fields in the early morning hours. The whole atmosphere was filled with the sound of spiritual songs. Sometimes when the farmers would not sing, the bulls would refuse to plough the fields. There is a mutual reciprocation between the farmer and his bulls that are peaceful by nature, obedient and friendly. The bull is gradually being replaced with the tractor. Some farmers nowadays play passionate cinema music to overpower the noise of the tractor. There is no more peace. One may argue that by using the tractor, the agricultural products increase in quantity. But at what cost? Farming is getting commercialized. So to make money, the farmer gets the tractor. Sometimes he has to take a big loan and sometimes they can't even repay those loans and uh, they end up committing suicide. Today, 150,000 farmers in India have committed suicide in areas where seed has been destroyed, where they have to buy the seed from Monsanto and buy it every year at very, very high cost. And that high cost seed is getting them into debt and that debt is pushing them to suicide. The trading is changing rapidly as well. Wealthy merchants come, buy the products wholesale and store them to release them for higher prices in times of shortage. These are the kind of tricks and tactics that are being used in the villages these days. Many different types of crops are grown in the field, which are cash crops. From cash crops, farmers profit more. Now in this area, they've begun to grow tobacco and tea, because it makes more money. Farmers are losing interest in producing grains and vegetables. The traditional village culture was meant to benefit everyone, including the animals, with a healthy long life. Crossbreeding or genetic manipulation is another issue of great concern. The world has experienced a massive surge in genetic engineering, and millions of people protest against it as being immoral and unethical, in and of itself. However, it needs to be mentioned that there are many who believe that the scientific research community can benefit from such an approach. Ethical concerns are raised when we start to understand the uses that advanced genetic engineering can be put to. Predetermination of a human skin color prior to birth, for instance. The possibilities of questionable consequences are unforeseen and limitless. Crossbreeding continues on a full scale and expands into the realm of genetic manipulated crops. Although the argument might be that crossbreeding is done to cure genetic problems, many believe it's very wrong for many reasons. What we've done is create community seed banks, places where we collect and save seeds, rescue them from disappearance, multiply them and then distribute them according to farmers' needs. And 
about 40 community seed banks have been created across the length and breadth of India. Places where these have been created, farmers are not in distress because the biggest cost today is seeds and chemicals. The ultimate crossbreeding and what perhaps people are waiting for but nobody dares to mention would be the crossbreeding between a human and an animal. BBC News, 5th of September 2007. Human-animal embryo green light. Scientists say such research is essential. Regulators have agreed in principle to allow human-animal embryos to be created and used for research. Opponents have said many people would be horrified by such a move. Scientists want to create crossbreed embryos by merging human cells with animal eggs. The embryos would then be destroyed within 14 days. There are grave ethical and moral objections to this research and the way it's being promoted. Anthony Ozemek, Secretary of Pro-Life Group, the Society for the Protection of Unborn Children. Using hybrid embryos has never been acceptable. It offends the dignity of humans and animals. Josephine Quinterval, comment on reproductive ethics. I know a lot of people nowadays are running around ecological adjustments, they're studying the North Pole and the ice flows and, you know, the breaking off of the ice shelves. Huge chunk of ice, six times the island of Manhattan has broken away from an ice shelf in Antarctica. The experts fear this breakaway is a sign of things to come. The disappearance of so many species, the increasing uh, desert uh, areas on the planet, the deforestation, etc., etc. And they're trying to think about how they can manage things in such a way that the consumer society can continue on. They'll never do that. Consumerism means increasing dissatisfaction. And as long as you're dissatisfied, you'll want more and more and more. It's endless. It's not possible to manage the earth with the current economic model that we have, consumerism. It does not work, it will not work, it will never work. There's been studies showing that although we've had a hundred years of more or less uninterrupted industrial, commercial, materialistic development, technology has grown by leaps and bounds. Studies show that happiness is flat or reducing. More stress, more anxiety, the actual quality of life is reducing. Villagers are living their faith and relation to the God much more in a sense of a relationship towards nature, beauty, seasons. While city people are more alienated, and live their religious life in a more abstract way. People in cities live in isolation. Isolation from nature, isolation from other people, isolation from themselves. It's called alienation. and wisdom of village people are of great value for resolving the diversity of conflicts and problems found in present-day urban civilization. Undoubtedly, the natural surrounding facilitates the cultivation of the higher values of life. In traditional Indian village life, spiritual festivals are of great importance and celebrated with much grandeur. Villagers gather from afar and participate in elaborate prayers and worship. Spiritual bonds are solidified as they all congregate on the banks of sacred rivers in a mood of total supplication. Visiting sacred places and spiritual festivals is considered going into the past thousands and millions of years when modern technology did not exist. Even then, 
people knew how to build enormous monuments and structures of beautiful and sophisticated architecture. Relationships this is a big part of our uh, life. In the villages, you see more steady, more reliable, more uh, long-lasting relationships. My mother was explaining how her marriage lasted for five days. Divorce, this is something that was unheard of. Occasionally, the whole village gets together. They all sit together and eat together like one big family. These are their loving exchanges, exchanging food, exchanging gifts. And towards the end, they all sit in their rows and uh, they're served sumptuous food. This food is good for body, good for mind, and good for soul also. It is said, you are what you eat. You are what you eat. together stays together this uh, binds them spiritually spiritual bonds are solidified as they all come together on the banks of sacred river Indrayani festival days used to be very special occasions anticipated with excitement by the villagers long before the event nowadays these festivals have started to become merely social events Mumbai, home to approximately 14 million people, is projected by 2015 to be the planet's second most populous metropolis after Tokyo. Since slums occupy just 3.5% of Mumbai's area, an estimate puts the number of people living in them at 400,000 per square kilometer. More than 6 million people live in slums today. Many also live dangerously close to the railway tracks, which cut through the heart of Mumbai. The class divide is starkest in cities like Mumbai, where million-dollar apartments overlook million-population slums. For all its glitz, Mumbai remains a place of inefficiency. 
At least one third of the population lacks clean drinking water and two million do not have access to any sanitary facilities. People from the village are running to the town, they are running to the cities, and the population in the city is ever-growing. It's already more than 50% of the people are in the cities, and the projection is 20 years from now, there'll be one-third in the villages, two-thirds in the cities, and the situation is getting worse and worse. This is very unhealthy. This must be some promotion, propagation, education must be undertaken so that this is running from village to the, to the city could be stopped or minimized at least. Is this a progress to reside in a situation like this? It's very hellish. Outdated trains are crammed with an average of 4,500 people, although most only have a capacity of 1,750. It's not surprising, therefore, that an astounding 3,500 travellers die every year on the tracks, with hundreds simply falling from the trains. Nonetheless, every day, hundreds move to the city to seek their fortune. One day, all those millions of expectations will have to be satisfied. But for now, Mumbai, or the city of dreams, is living up to the very meaning of its name. Almost 54% of Mumbaikas live in slums today. Another 25 to 30% live in chawls and footpaths. 200 to 300 new families come to Mumbai daily and most end up living in a slum. According to Professor R. N. Sharma, head of urban studies of social sciences, Mumbai is undoubtedly disintegrating into slums. By the year 2025, slums will be everywhere. We are already more or less used to the conditions that we are living in. But the first year when I came to work in Mumbai, it was very hard and often I used to run back to my home village. But I have come back to this polluted place as our work is here. In the city, we have no proper time for eating and sleeping, and we always have to run here and there. In the village, we just do our farming and stay peacefully with our families. But here, nobody asks you anything. No one here cares for you as your family does. No one cares whether one is alive or dead. In the village, even if someone is your enemy, he will help you in critical situations. But you will not find anyone here who will help you. Things that we can experience in the village cannot be realized in the cities. Today, everyone is running towards the city, but they are not happy. They could have lived very peacefully in the village. It's the understanding of man's relationship with nature that has to be rectified. Then everything will come back into balance. The fact is that the consumer model, the economic model of consumerism, is in itself contradictory to the pursuit of happiness. When we compare the standard of living of today with that of 30 or 40 years ago, we can see a significant change. The people who have simpler needs are naturally more content. Although we're told that by consumerism that will increase our happiness, exactly the opposite is true. Because if you understand how a consumer society works, it's not based on achievement of happiness, it's based on dissatisfaction and remaining in a state of constant dissatisfaction.
The morning mist, gently touching the hills and mountains in the valleys, slowly reveals the splendor and beauty of untouched nature. The lush green grass spreads like a soft carpet through the fields and forests, as if inviting busy humans and animals to be at leisure. Bumblebees collect honey from a variety of colorful flowers. Rivers are filled with fresh clean water and a large variety of trees and bushes carry fruits, berries and nuts in abundance. Mother Nature provides everything, including the raw materials people require for providing all the necessities of life. In uh, New Rajadam, Krishna Valley, uh, we try to realize the concept of Varnashram and sustainability in three different features. Sustainability, which is economic, sustainability and harmony with the environment, and sustainability in a social framework. Since it's a very size experiment, where 150 people are involved, more than 50 institutions are involved. That's a real massive sustainability project in the middle of Europe. Actually the most developing sustainability project in the middle of Europe. Whatever success we've achieved here in New Dam is because the devotees who lived here, the leaders who've taken responsibility for this place, have actually cooperated together to accept that in their family life, uh, in their personal individual life, in raising their children, in how they practice spiritual life, they accept one common set of laws and they only expect rights on the basis of what the community itself can provide, not more, and they see that actually the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. In the old times in Sweden, all farmers were self-sufficient, all village, villages were uh, self-sufficient. In a village, there was everything you needed, basically speaking. So when the village isn't there, these different relationships are also ceasing to exist, this sharing and giving. So in America, where we're living now, 200 years ago, approximately 97% of the population was engaged in agricultural activities. But now in this high-speed technology, um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has estimated that approximately 2 to 3% of the population is still involved in agricultural pursuits. So that's a real challenge because a lot of, a lot of the um, motivation behind the modern new sustainable movement that's sweeping the world the, the dialogue worldwide about sustainability is driven by economics 40 50 years ago while i was just a child in my village we were just satisfied to be here but now there are different trends people of the village are moving to the town town folks are moving to the big cities Big city people are, they're trying to go to the moon. <laughs> so wherever they go, they don't seem to be very happy. But the formula to be happy is a natural living or a simple living and high thinking. As our occupation is farming, we are settled in the village and we love it there. We do not prefer cities as our main livelihood is from farming. 
We do our household chores and then we do our farm work. We couldn't stay in a city. We are happy with village life. We grow sugarcane, wheat, corn, grains, peanuts and vegetables. Everything is from our fields. We never go to the market to purchase anything. We only do farming and we don't hanker for more. Farming is the only source of income for us. We like to stay in the village very much because it is in the lap of nature, free from all kinds of pollution. There are beautiful farms here and very nice, kind people. Indian villages are quite self-sufficient. Villagers depend mostly on agriculture. All the food that is required by them for a whole year, they get from the fields. So they are self-sufficient. Early in the morning, there will be the sound of grinding grains and happy singing. Then the butter will be churned for cooking and the food was being offered. Then the whole family will be sitting and eating together. Relationships are a crucial part of our lives. In the villages, relationships are more steady, reliable and long-lasting. The whole village is like one big family, depending on and supporting each other. It used to be like that, but unfortunately, this is changing now. In villages, one can get milk, good foodstuff, without the risk of pollution. Village life is more peaceful and self-sufficient with fewer problems compared to city life. I can honestly say that I have an attraction for village life. With clean air and a pure climate, one can actually progress by doing farming. Real life means to work in the fields. Real nature lies in the villages. India is the land of villages. Its entire economic status is based on farms. If the villages become prosperous, then it won't take much time for the country to become prosperous as well. I'm doing what I could do to create awareness of what is being lost in the villages and how we could preserve the villages, the values, the heritage that comes with the village. It seems that gradually the city ideas concepts and the style of living and thinking begin to dominate and defeat traditional values, the innocence of people and the unity and purity of the village. Not only Arav Day is endangered of being lost, but rather 500,000 villages in India and millions worldwide. This diminishing factor is of great global concern. There could be the best of both worlds, the best of villages and the best of towns and cities. But at the rate at which things are changing and getting lost, one cannot even begin to imagine what the future will hold for us and our future generation. Let's not see this disappearing from the scene, the simplicity in the village, the purity of the village. We should do all, everything within our might, all the forces, so uh, it's my appeal to uh, each and every one of you. Despite the dramatic upheavals in rural communities, 
Village Life is and will continue to play an integral role in the fabric of human society. The sense of tranquility, the principle of pure living, the presence of farms and animals, the coexistence with nature, and the intimate connection with the earth and environment remain the shelter for everyone on this planet. Villages and farms, often hardly even noticeable on maps, are the cornerstone of human civilization. These villagers and farmers need all the support they deserve in their battle with the urban invasion. <laughs>